If an alien force were ever to invade planet Earth, we would presumably be met with an enemy literally light years ahead of our technological capabilities. Our most powerful weapons might be useless against them, if they work at all. One case in the 1960s illustrates the frightening possibility of this very reality. An entire base of U.S. military personnel were put on high alert in an incident that continues to spark debate and conjecture to this day. Joining me are Ron Murphy, Heather Mosier, Katie Page, Micah Hanks, and Mark Matsky. I'm Aaron Deese, and this is UFOs Revisited. Today we are talking about the Malmstrom UFO incident, which to me is incredibly interesting because of the possible implications it could have. But before we get too deep into any of that, what do we know about this case? Well, you know, I mean, March 16th, 1967, the essential facts are that we had multiple personnel saying that they were observing what we would today call unidentified aerial phenomena. Uh, and this seemed to coincide with the shutdown of the ballistic missile weapon systems there at that base, according to the narrative that has been presented. Now, some have said, you know, how could something like this happen to a strategic air facility? Uh, how could this have been, you know, kept off the books? This is momentous. Uh, information, but it has actually actually also been revisited during recent congressional hearings that we've seen. Uh, you know, there have been congressmen and women who have been asking about this, trying to get to the bottom of you know how often have there been strategic facilities that have been targeted, seemingly by UAP. Uh, but according to the principal witnesses, Robert Salas and others, they say yes. You know, we were on duty on this occasion, and there was something that was happening that seems to show a clear blind spot in our defense capabilities. And I believe that this didn't only start in 1967 at Malmstrom. I mean, we have uh, Francis E. Warren out of Cheyenne Air Force Base, where multiple witnesses, multiple military personnel are spotting something anomalous over the base there in Wyoming. They house nukes as well. And also then in 1966 in uh, Pino, North Dakota, I believe it was, um, they had nukes shut down 10, I believe, just like Malmstrom as well. So this phenomenon is seen time and time again. So this is a recurring theme. We often hear conjecture that UFOs, UAPs, um, I will use the terms interchangeably because that's just what I'm used to, but we often hear that they seem to have an interest in military operations and military bases, but we actually have a recurring pattern in which they seem to interfere with our technology is, is what it seems is taking shape right now. Well, I think that we always assume that if an advanced race visits our planet, uh, that they have the same type of outlook that we as human beings have, something about conquest or something. But what these cases are demonstrating, that there is a lesson to be learned, that for whatever reason, they're inter interfering with our technology to, sh to destroy ourselves, right? That there's some reason why they want to make their presence known in a form of uh, almost peacekeeping, or, or at least trying to keep these kind of dangers out of our hands, or at least alert us to the idea of what we're capable of doing. You know, there's a lot of xenophobia, I think, whenever it comes to aliens. It's the outsider, right? And especially during the Cold War, we were always afraid of the other. Um, and then whenever the other actually comes in and instead of shows aggression towards us, it's somehow showing us that, you know, the way that we're, we're going down uh, could be to our, our detriment. Uh, I think that really kind of opens our eyes to why we're being visited by whatever's coming here. Yeah, that's a rich sort of um, theme that comes through starting in the 50s with the Space Brothers and the messages that they have for people. Before there were abductions and it starts to become a rather fearsome topic, the Space Brothers always seem to be interacting with people saying things like, don't destroy yourselves. You know, we're here to try to kind of prevent you from doing what humans are typical of doing. Mm -hmm. And so this to me is a, like take a couple steps more aggressive in trying to shut down the possibility of us actually using that technology to blow up the world. For whatever reason, they seem to want to prevent that from happening. I've often wondered, do they care so much about humans or humanity, or do they just care about planet Earth? And do they really take an interest as to whether we harm each other? Because we tend to do that. Um, but I think perhaps maybe they're sending us a message that, hey, you know, we're, you can go ahead and destroy yourselves, but we're not going to let you destroy this planet. 
I was going to say there's a fascinating uh, uh, point, and, and that is, is the origins uh, of these visitors, right? Uh, are they something extraterrestrial from a distant planet? Or there's a theory that they are indeed humans from the future coming back, and if that is the case, maybe they are trying to teach us something that, you know, if we go down this road, there might not be a planet to come back to. Yeah, there's that, and then there's also a discussion from um, other cases where aliens are actually trying to keep us alive to keep themselves alive. Like, as in they need to hybridize, something's weak in their DNA, they need something like that, and so perhaps that would be another reason to disarm us so that we can't hurt ourselves, therefore hurt them as well, even if it's not their planet. So it kind of presents us with two possible scenarios here. This could be a statement that we understand you have the capability to destroy yourselves and we would like to stop you, or the other way, looking at it from maybe a darker angle, we have the capability to shut down the most powerful devices you have ever constructed. And that's one thing about this case that really hits me is the, just the technological aspects of it. From my understanding, these missiles were independently wired. This is not a situation where someone hacked into a Wi-Fi router, again, this was 1967, and was able to just check off a few boxes and shut these things down. They were independent systems, is my understanding. And again, that takes us to a level of technology I don't think our brains can even quite wrap themselves around that, even in the internet age where we're all carrying supercomputers around in our pockets. Just why would alien technology in any way be compatible with ours? And yet in this scenario, it seems that it is. So the time traveler theory is very interesting because let's, let's speculate a little bit. If someone did come from our future, they would know how our technology works, presumably. So that's a very interesting idea. And they would also know where our technology ultimately leads. So, uh, and we, we could be seeing you know something of ourselves uh, coming back and saying, let, let, let's not do this anymore. But there is also a point too, if this is an outside interference, uh, it could be a preemptive strike. Like nothing that you have is capable of doing anything to us. So if we do show up, don't start launching anything at us because it's not gonna work. It could be something like that as well. Something that we often are seeing in a lot of modern UAP cases and those that extend back several decades like Malmstrom uh, is the apparent ability of whomever or whatever is behind these technologies. I try to remain pretty agnostic about it, but uh, somehow they seem to be able to, uh, you know, de-encrypt our encrypted communications channels. They seem to have an idea of knowing what we're going to do, where we're going to go, even before we do. Uh, when it comes to the technology, that's something that really interests me because mm -hmm. starting from the base level up and saying, well, you, could this be a human technology? And if it's not humans of today, could this be something from tomorrow? And if it's not even that, then could it be something even more exotic? I have looked at the technology and tried to understand, you know, what exactly was happening at Malmstrom? Um, is it true that there was no way that these weapon systems could be taken offline? Now, there was an investigation done around that time by Boeing. And one thing that they found was that if a 10 volt uh, you know, uh, power surge was, was sent through directly to the logic coupler, this could have, if it was directly introduced, this could have actually potentially taken these weapon systems offline, but they don't know how in the world that would have been introduced. The only way externally that that could have been induced would have been through an electromagnetic pulse. Uh, now we hear a lot about EMP these days, mm -hmm. but the problem is, is in 1967, at least as far as known technologies, there shouldn't have been anything that we had that would have been capable of that 10 volts needed to be able to disable the logic coupler. Um, by today's standards, we might have that kind of technology. So here again, we're looking at something, whatever its source, that appears to be just a few steps ahead of us. Today we can say, yeah, we know how that might have happened. How did you do that in 1967? Right, and these are housed so far underground. And, and to your point, I think that's important because if they're able to do that and we figure out how they were able to do that, we want to keep our enemies from being able to do that in the future, right. so, right? What was really interesting, I saw the, the interview that Nick Pope did with him that uh, was televised, and Robert Salas said something that I found a little bit chilling and yet understandable at the same time in his role. He said that, you know, as, as striking and frightening as it was to have that go down while he was overseeing the whole thing, he was most concerned with the fact that if the order came through to launch, he was not able to. Not necessarily something shut us down, what was it, this is terrifying. It was, 
I've now lost my capability of fulfilling my role as, uh, you know, this, the one who pushes the button for good. And that just, that really struck me and um, just says something, I think, about the, the duty of our, our armed forces and how concerned they are with being able to um, fulfill what they're called to do. Because when you first hear a story like this, I think the gut reaction, at least for me, that a lot of us feel is, oh my God, they can shut down our missiles. Like that's, that's kind of where the dialogue ends in my mind, but the perspective of someone who's responsible for those missiles, that's interesting just to note that difference. Do you think there's a possibility that this was something that we kind of tested on ourselves just to see what our reaction would be? On that point, Heather, you know, I have heard from researchers and also some, from some other sources over the years that uh, a hypothetical would be that there might have been some kind of U.S. experimental technologies yeah. and that the intention, rather than so much to disable weapons, had been to see what people's reactions to weapons being disabled might have been. Mm -hmm. uh, now, again, to me, I like to try and go off, I know Katie would agree, you know, mm -hmm. documents and, and, you know, resources and things that we can, you know, establish kind of a, a baseline for truth in terms of investigations. I know of no definitive sources that say, yeah, we had that technology, there was a secret operation, we were gauging, you know, it was a psychological warfare thing, let's see how these guys not only respond to their weapon systems being taken offline, but let's make them think it was aliens. I've, right. I found no evidence that something like that was done. Uh, but there have been people who have proposed that idea. They've proposed similar things about cattle mutilations. Let's make right. silent helicopters that look like UFOs, and that's a cover for something else we might try to do. So I, I've wondered about that, and in mm -hmm. that context, it's even more concerning because today we look at cases like the Tic Tac from 2004, USS Nimitz uh, Carrier Strike Group 11, and they're doing their operations out there off the Baja California coast. Immediately more skeptically inclined researchers would say, even if there is a real phenomena here, that phenomena is our technology, and we were testing this against our own military personnel. You ask those Navy pilots about that, you know, Commander Frave or Commander Dietrich, they don't say, well, yeah, that's probably some of, you know, some of our technology being tested. No, they said we were never briefed on that. And none mm -hmm. of the individuals at Malmstrom in 67 were briefed on that either. So that's an interesting question. I wondered that mm -hmm. myself. And again, would we have had that technology at that time? We today can look back and say we know how it might have been done, but who had that and for what reason would we have done that to our own servicemen and women? Well, and, and this is a genuine question I don't know the answer to. Is EMP technology sufficiently advanced at this point in time that we could replicate this, that we could point something like this at a foreign power and say, we're gonna turn all of your nukes off? If that tech exists today, I think we've got a problem. But it probably does. And that, to me, that is almost a more frightening prospect. And I expect this is a theme that we'll return to as we have these discussions. But an alien entity, we can speculate over what their motivations might be, what their ultimate purpose might be. Human beings don't have a great track record. So it's, it's almost, in my mind, scarier that this would have been an act of human intervention versus something that we can't understand, whether it's from outer space, the future, another dimension. And in another interesting part of this, uh, you know, from let's say 1965, 66, 67 through these years, um, a lot of the descriptions of this orange reddish glow and um, I think Sala said that there seemed to be structure to it. Um, they were all very similar sightings. They looked similar, the same light configurations. And now you're talking about the Tic Tac. So these, these um, ETs or craft have changed through the decades, you know, it makes me wonder. I mean, I don't think at that time we had, and they were silent and they were able to hover. In the mid 60s, we didn't have this kind of technology to just hover over our bases like that. Or technology that we didn't know about. See, that's an interesting thing as well, too, and something we'll revisit. So if the technology did exist out there and, and human beings had that technology, where did it come from? So that's the possibility then that we were dealing with found technology, you know, that, that somehow we were able to uh, uh, find some sort of, you know, off-world type of uh, information and then adapt it for our own use. Well, 56 years later, you know, we, we know that military technology is generally very far ahead of what we know about. It takes a couple, few decades, speaking in very broad terms, before those things become public knowledge. If we had this working EMP weapon at the end of the 60s, even a prototype, where is it? That seems like something, if you had a functioning device as a government power that could shut down a nuclear weapon, you would want other people to know about that as a deterrent. 
is, is my thinking. I'm obviously not a government intelligence operative. I had an interesting conversation with a prominent skeptic uh, at a conference a number of years ago. Uh, I had put forward the idea to him, I said, you know, maybe some of these things, some of the UFO sightings from over the years, maybe they are our technology. And he said, oh, I don't think that's the case at all. And I said, well, what's your you know, logic behind that? And he essentially said, if, if we had been developing these technologies, you know, if there were advanced propulsion capabilities, anything resembling flying saucers or anything like this that we read about in all the popular literature, if we developed that decades ago, by now, surely we would know about that, like we know about the U-2, like we know about the SR-71 Blackbird, you know, like we know about all these things. And so I said, well, then do you mean that you think that there's another explanation for popular UFO sightings, he said, oh yeah, I certainly do. So here I thought, okay, a skeptic, you know, a real hardened skeptic is gonna finally tell me what he thinks these things are. And he said, I think these people are just lying. Yeah. <laughs> now, obviously I disagree on that point. Uh, I do think that some people lie. I do think some people may be, uh, you know, misperceiving things that they see. But the idea that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily know about technologies. I mean, you go back and you look at Bill Sweetman and a lot of these excellent uh, aerospace and defense journalists digging into whether a Project Aurora existed. Look, I'm pretty convinced at this point. There's some incredible secret technologies that have not come to light and that our U.S. government does have an edge. This has even been alluded to by the former director of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, the Pentagon's unit that investigates these things, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. He says the U.S. has an edge. Do I think that accounts for all these things? No. Nah. I mean, there's got to be something else going on. But I, I certainly don't think that we know all the secrets, and just because we had it decades ago, it would necessarily be revealed today. These missiles were offline for 24 hours, and whenever we think about possible scenarios involving nuclear warfare, that is an eternity. You know, we have these early warning and early detection systems set up so that if one of these weapons is ever set off anywhere on the planet, we know about it. And that's my very basic layman's term explanation for it. Okay, but 24 hours, if this were some kind of a government experiment, that's a very, very long time to cripple your own defensive system. So just something that came to me right now. Weren't these very powerful weapons as well? I mean, I think what uh, dropped on Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima? Right. I can't always say that wrong. But there was like 20 and these were like 100. It was like 10 times or something. These would have been intercontinental little ballistic, ballistic missiles that would have been, you know, part of our, I mean, our primary defense system, especially right. at the height of the Cold War. Right. Um, so the question is, if we're going to test a technology or we're going to do any kind of a test where these are taken offline, yeah. why are we leaving ourselves potentially open? A, a quick scenario, imagine what happens if an enemy nation finds out we're doing a test like that. Their missiles are going to be off for a whole 24 hours. What do we do during that time, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is a time when we know there were Soviet operatives in different places in the U.S. government. You know, intelligence was a big thing at that time. That's, that's a dumb way to say that. The, the, we were in the middle of the Cold War, just like Micah said, so it's hard for me to imagine anyone signing off, you know, in any position of authority on testing our weapons on our own weapons at that time, when we do have testing facilities where they develop and test these weapons anyway. So why do it on a live base? I guess is my question. And we were five years removed from the Cuban Missile Crisis where we were at the brink of nuclear war. And I would think that that would be a suicidal thing to cripple our own defenses. Well said. Yeah. Here's an interesting idea that came to me while I was on the plane on the way to have this discussion with you guys. What if this is an extraterrestrial interdimensional power and this is some kind of a prank? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, of course we're projecting, as I said before, we're projecting very human uh, emotions and motives onto something that we probably shouldn't. But I, I do know what you're talking about. Somebody has a kind of like a new toy and say, let's see what we can do. You know what I mean? This is like a, an eighth grade science project to them. You know, I think that there is something to be said about um, a superior race coming to this planet and kind of showing off a bit, you know? Um, and uh, and I mean, that's all, that's all I can say about that. But I think that it makes sense too, because there was no provocation of any kind and there was no kind of follow-up attack or anything. So whatever happened was to prove a point, a 24-hour point, right? So I think the, the idea that there was kind of um, a little uh, tongue-in-cheek thing going on there uh, is, a, is an extreme possibility. 
you know, another important point, too, that Katie raised earlier is, I mean, place this in the context of all the other similar incidents that were occurring around that time. I mean, mm -hmm. in the 1960s and 70s, we had Minot Air Force Base, Malmstrom Air Force Base, Wurtsmith Air Force Base. Many years later, I think there was an incident at F.E. Warren. Right. I mean, there have been numerous instances where uh, weapons have gone offline, uh, UAP have been observed hovering over these facilities, strategic air command facilities, again, of great significance to our national security. So, I mean, it, it almost reminds me, in a way, uh, if I were to make a comparison to something I heard the recent whistleblower David Grush say, uh, talking about the, uh, the way that he feels he's been or, or intimidated a bit after coming forward with things he's talked about. And he said, I was uh, made aware in my wife as well that they could touch me at any time. Mm. Uh, and that thought kind of comes to mind in the sense that if there were a non-aggressive way of conveying, listen, just so you know, we're here, we can touch you at any time. If we were going with the ET or any kind of other exotic explanation, that seems to be what's being demonstrated. Hey, we're here, we can hover over your base, we can take your weapon systems offline. What are you gonna do about it? Precisely, what if this happens again? What if, what if this was just round one and 60 years later, there's gonna be however many red orbs popping, like, right, like what? what if this was the beginning of something? And then to take into account, like Micah said, um, the human, how this affects the men and women who serve and they're told they can't talk about these things, not even to, I think his name was David, one of the other witnesses with Bob Salas, um, Colonel David something, I can't remember his last name, it's escaping me, but I mean, he was emotional when he was finally able decades later to be able to share with his wife and his family what happened to him out at Melmstrom um, and that human element, these these men and women who have to keep these secrets, it's it's uh, pretty incredible what yeah. this affected these people's lives. Yeah, and as a follow-up to that, I read an interview with Salas, it was published very recently, where he said the AARO, established in July 22, was a whistleblower hotline. And, and this was the remarkable quote, and I wanted to write it down because I wanted to get it right for Robert Salas' sake. He said, this was a milestone I had never told my story to a government office before 2022. So that speaks exactly to that point. There has been no mechanism for these people to really tell their story and not feel like, I, if I say anything about this, I'm going to get buried, you know, figuratively. But um, it's great that this exists now because you can't imagine that pressure or what, you, you know, emotionally trying to process that would that much have been like. Yeah. How do you even explain it to your superiors in the, in the moment? Mm -hmm. I'm not even thinking about how it affects you later on. I mean, in that moment as your job, everything goes down. What do you, how do you say that? Like, I'm sorry, I can't do my job right now. I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and then the long lasting repercussions of that beyond that, especially if you can't tell your family. It kind of takes us back to something that I think is often lost in some of these discussions we have today, and that's the human element of these stories. And that's something I do hope to continue to re return to as we have these conversations, but these have lasting, irreparable, sometimes impacts on the people that witness them, sometimes physically, sometimes their careers, sometimes mentally. But I mean, this is a really striking example, you know, that if you think about the military mindset, like it was, like you said earlier, of being responsible for this system, and it's all of a sudden rendered inert, you know, I panic when my smartphone locks up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, put me in charge of 10 missiles. I don't know. I don't want to yeah. think about it. Yeah. So let me raise this question. If an advanced race or any race is capable of, of doing this, take, taking nuclear weapons offline, um, why would they not in some way verbalize it to us? You know, their, 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 their point being, um, you know, I, even if they don't speak our language, you can broadcast something on television or, or anything like that. If they're capable of taking missiles offline, they would be capable of projecting something onto our television sets as well too, especially at that time. So if this is done in a kind of an altruistic way, showing us the error of our ways, why are they doing it clandestine and not doing it in more of a vocal, impactful way around the world? I would say that comes down to what their objectives are. I, I often, I, and what, by that what I mean, I often hear uh, a lot of celebrity scientists going on television and saying, look guys, if ET were coming all this distance, if they were traveling from Zeta to Reticuli and coming all the way to Earth, they're not going to stop in and say hello or you know, pop down on the White House lawn and introduce themselves, take me to your leader style. And I'm thinking, I mean, you look at 
all the, the, the genocide, you look at, of course, the pandemic, you look at all the problems that humanity faces, some of our own making and some that nature just bequeaths to us. If I were extraterrestrial visitors and I were hovering up there or maybe hiding out in our oceans, I'd probably stay there. I, there's not much incentive I see to want to try and engage directly. But if I do want to try and convey uh, to, the, to the earthlings that, hey, listen, we're here and there are certain things you need to know, uh, a, a very effective way of doing that without, you know, causing panic. And again, panic may not be a concern of theirs, but if they do want to keep a low profile, but indicate to those who are aware of their presence, you know, here's what we can do. It seems like this would be exactly how they would go about it. I do think that humans have a tendency to anthropomorphize, you know. Centuries ago, we placed ourselves at the center of the universe. Today, in a lot of ways, societally and otherwise, we still do that. And, and we always expect, well, if the aliens were coming here, they should be doing this, and they should look like this, and they should say these things. All bets are off. Who can even guess what their actual motivations would be? The possibility of communication outside of interfering with our technology might not even be possible. Like, we might be talking about beings that, putting it very simply, up is purple and left is three. Like they're coming from a completely different place. So frames of reference might be so different that the only way they can think to interact is to interfere with our technology. You know, language might be something that's a completely different concept for them. So, but that's another idea that I'm sure we can continue to explore. You know, another thing I'll introduce, and here's a talking point. I read an essay the other day uh, that was essentially arguing that uh, some of the chief proponents of the Malmstrom incident uh, essentially made the story up as a way to try and leverage uh, more information from government to try and bolster the idea that, uh, you know, we need uh, disclosure and things along these lines. Uh, which I find to be a very incredible argument, especially given how many members of the military, how many personnel were on duty who came forward later and said that they mm -hmm. recalled these events as described on March 16, 1967. Uh, and also, again, all of the continuing incidents occurring, particularly along the northern tier back in the 1970s. But I'd be interested in hearing, you know, what our participants here would say. I mean, what do you think about those who would say this entire thing was made up? Is that in itself potentially damaging to national security in the sense that it takes attention away from what may be some of the most important national defense incidents in the history of the United States? I, I would think that the uh, men and women that are in charge of such a thing, uh, again, following orders and doing their duty, I think it would be almost impossible for people at that level to make up a story. Um, it can trickle down in some way. The decisions are made up at the top. And by the time it trickles down, it's seen as something far different by those people who are actually serving. But I, I, I tend to think that um, everybody was, uh, you know, in on it. I, I don't see that as a possibility. I, I really don't. Yeah, so nobody is joining the military for the money, right? I mean, people are, are deliberately serving their country. I mean, this, this is, this is their, their, their goal in life. And, and I think that we should not denigrate our servicemen and women for something along these lines. Uh, yeah, so I think that now, of course, I, I can say differently about people that are higher ups, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, because there's agendas on everything. But I think the people that are manning these missiles don't have this kind of theory in their mind. Hey, if we do this and we're on this, maybe we could get some sort of closure. I don't see that happening. And what you do see as an emerging pattern are those who have served retire. And if they feel like we, we should push for disclosure or more truth to be brought to light, that's when it happens. Mm -hmm. Not so much in the middle of an event, you know, like faking an event or, or something to make, to force reaction or what have you. But there is a, a, a pattern of people who have gone through that, done their duty, followed their orders to the letter, and then after the fact say, we did this, but now we want to provide the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. And that exists outside of the UFO paranormal world as well. I mm -hmm. mean, there are plenty of government things that have come to light over the years that participants didn't speak about at the time, but later on, exactly when she just yeah. described. I do think Micah asks a very important question because, you know, in the interest of remaining open-minded, any of these cases that we'll eventually discuss could be the result of misinformation, disinformation, which are different things, as we discussed recently. We'll talk about that as we go as well. But I also, I, I, I like how you describe that, Ron, you know, that when you're talking about servicemen and women who have committed their lives to this sort of thing, faking a UFO hoax is pretty low on their list of likely activities, but I think those are both very important points. But then we get the idea of disinformation, that we brought that up, is because that's a great way 
to control the public, right? Because you're putting out certain information, and then you're going to discredit some people, and then give other people more veracity. So you're kind of confused about what's going on. Now that's something that I can buy into there. I, I, I can see that happening as well. Um, but uh, that can also happen um, from something that is uh, planned by our government, but also something if there was indeed a true extraterrestrial presence or an outside presence doing the exact same thing for the exact same purposes, kind of keep you confused and never truly have your eyes open to exactly what is going on. It makes a lot of sense to me too that if there is an extraterrestrial intelligence out there in the universe, and I know eventually we'll get to talk about some of the abduction phenomena, but we hear a lot of these connections with abduction or an ET presence in the lives of people who have military backgrounds in their family, whether it's Navy, Air Force, and Marines, Army. And if I were coming from somewhere else, I would want to know what military they have on their planet. So when I'd look at their families, what are the humans' motivations? Why are they creating these nukes? What's going on there? And, you know, I think that might all tie into some of these cases as well. And that's a good point. Not only uh, the abduction cases, not only from people that were in the military, but the ch their children as well, too, that weren't even in the military. These people were also claiming abductions as well. I have that it happened a week before as well, that this, this had gone on. It happened twice. The weapons down went down first. So this wasn't just a one-off. It happened twice. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Ten, ten missiles uh, wow. shut down 24 hours apiece. And I'm wondering if the 24 hours just isn't like the default when uh, something right, goes right, out right. that's just automatically out for 24 hours, more so than it being a situation of 24 hours for them to figure out how to fix it kind of situation. Right, we're taking out your missiles for one Earth Day. Kind of right, thing. Yeah, that's exactly, right. that's right. <laughs> taking your toys. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, slap on the wrist. That's interesting as well, because if this happened once and then it happened again a week later, at least in those seven days, they did not come up with a way to prevent it, or at least were not able to identify what caused it sufficient to prevent it from happening again. That's because you would think if it were an internal error of some kind, you know, we installed a bad fuse and I all went out at the same time. We would have figured that out sometime in that seven day period. That's interesting as well. At several of these locations where incidents like this happened, there were actually multiple uh, incidents. I think there were a couple of incidents at Minot. Mm -hmm. uh, Malmstrom, of course, had multiple incidents. And yeah. so, and, and, and all of these essentially, I mean, the real kind of height of this having occurred within maybe a couple of decades, you know, decade and a half. Now, we can go back a little earlier in the history. In fact, there was a really excellent uh, paper by uh, Larry Hancock and Ian Porritt of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, where they uh, looked at the incidents involving uh, UAP sightings near or over strategic facilities throughout the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly they, they found that, I mean, it seems to be that in the broader context, maybe from the late 1940s, you know, incidents over Oak Ridge and other locations, all the way up to maybe some of those from more recent decades, that this would be consistent with an intelligence gathering kind of an effort, you know, basically surveillance, but primarily, especially right there toward the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, this incredible surge of sightings that was also consistent with uh, observations of our atomic warfare complex. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if we look at a, a historical survey that looks at data and that it, it uses test cases, you know, with, with a, a, a facility, a strategic air command facility, for instance, and then a nearby city comparing UFO sightings between what happened near the base and what happened near the nearest urban center, and they look at that uh, in the broader picture, it certainly seems that there's data that supports mm. that there was some kind of a, we call it a phenomenon, but I think in cases like this, it's hard not to say there seems to be a technology with a motive that is clearly demonstrating a motive. Mm -hmm. um, and cases like these further were the main focal point, uh, one of them, of a book called Clear Intent back in the 19, uh, I guess it was written in the 80s, but it dealt with a lot of these cases, Barry Greenwood and Lawrence Fawcett. Excellent book still. <laughs> and, and again, that title said it all. Uh, it had been referencing a quote from a military official who said that, you know, whatever these objects are, they demonstrate a clear intent. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be we're looking at these facilities. It's obvious that these are military strategic sites. Those mm -hmm. are extreme national security uh, significance to the United States. And they're observing our capabilities. And perhaps at times also, as we see in this case, uh, interfering with that for some unstated purpose, but one that we can infer. But logically, it does seem to be that data indicates that something has been observing what we can do, what we have, 
keeping an, uh, an, an eye on that. Uh, and with obvious strategic uh, interests. Whether they have military motives is another question, but they are aware of what we can do because they seem to be surveilling and they have a strategic interest in that. That's an interesting point because that makes me, just in this moment, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you're probably right. Whatever being out there, they may have globally, uh, planet Earth, all our military strategic, or Russia, China, the United States, and they have this map. Now, you can say there's those that believe that they want to come in and save us and help us. So if you guys get to that point, we're going to come in and shut you down and we're going to save all, all of you. But maybe, to your point, it's nefarious and maybe they're like oh we have everything mapped out we know exactly what they can do and if they wanted to come and invade and wipe us all out boom there they have it so it could go either way if only we had oh man more intelligence from russia and from china and we knew yeah. that they had these kinds of things and if historically they've been experiencing these same kinds of things The Malmstrom case and others like it, many of the ones that we've discussed today, have what could be very chilling implications. Whether or not these entities are hostile, curious, or trying to keep us from destroying ourselves, these cases force us to reassess our place not only on our own planet, but in what may be a very populated universe.